I'm really delighted to be with you. As Don said, I'm a regular here. I'm filling massive boots um, when it comes to John. Um, I can't wait to kind of see you on your road and thank you for your years of service, but it's been an absolute honor. I'm sure we'll all agree. Um, but I'm going to be talking about rise of the super malicious user in particular. Um, so Tim has talked a little bit already about the insider threat, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to go to that one step further. Now, I think it's fair to say, when we think about people in our organization, most of them, the vast majority, are just trying to do their job. They're just trying to do the right thing. Um, but really, when does risk become a threat? Now, insider risk um, happens in every single organization. And this is just people who make mistakes, in essence. Um, so we introduce new processes, new technology, new ways of working. They accidentally send an email or a document to the wrong John Smith. None of this is malicious. It's just normal activity, but the impact is still the same. So how does an insider risk become a threat? Well, the difference really is someone who absolutely does know what they're doing. Um, and that really is the intent behind it. It's the malicious intent in particular. Um, and some of these are not really kind of thinking about things. So they might be, I'm going to work for a new competitor down the road. Um, I have really like that report. That's really cool. I like some of your pricing. I'll just take that down the road. They might not really see that as stealing intellectual property. And then there's a group of people who absolutely couldn't care less. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, whatever data is available, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we're kind of used to this. An insider threat is still a taboo subject. As much as we talk about it, think about it, we don't really like to talk about it because these are trusted people. These are employees. We've brought these people into our company. So why, why is it then that we have some of this additional group? And really what I want to talk about is the super malicious insider. Um, and in particular, these are people who absolutely do know what they're doing and their whole plan is to cause as much damage as possible. And not only that, they know every single loophole in your organization. So let's look at some of the characteristics. Let's look at some of these things in particular. So DTEC in particular issued a report and what they looked at was all the different incidents of data breaches, what happened, what are some of the characteristics. And what they identified, 32% of all malicious incidents were related to IP, data theft, trade secret, source code, active collaboration with an outsider in particular. Really kind of uh, active in financial services, critical infrastructure, um, and various different things. Now, as technology is getting better and better, we are seeing some threat actors who are favoring going directly to source. That's the people. Now, dependent on the level of stress those people are under, the kind of the mood, what's going on in their life, they might think this is a bit of an easy way of making a bit of money on the side. Um, so you may be familiar with Lapsus, uh, the British actually uh, threat actor, really, really good at social engineering, um, but they were known in essence for buying credentials, buying an MFA bypass, look the other way, go to lunch, put this remote access software into play. Um, and sometimes they were paying up to $15,000 um, for that. But this, I'm really what I'm talking about is another group on top of that. So these are people who absolutely know what they're doing. Um, they're willingly giving their credentials away, really willing to kind of give information away and don't really care about it. So the super malicious user in particular knows about how your processes work. They understand technology. They might even even understand your inside of threat program and therefore they know every single loophole in your organization. So some characteristics, um, so they may understand how you are looking for insiders. How do you classify an insider? What are you looking for? What are the alerts? Uh, the kind of the second area really is having a really deep understanding of your environment, the monitoring, what you're looking for, how you're looking for it, and what you're going to do about it as a result. 
And then we kind of have people who know how to circumvent system controls, they'll know how to bypass those things. Um, and really then kind of thinking about how they're going to commit that fraud, how they commit that sabotage, um, and how they're going to kind of have those violations. But also there's a huge increase in open source intelligence and practices and really trying to think about how they're kind of concealing what they're doing from the workplace and from other people. So let's think about some examples um, where we've had these kind of malicious, super malicious insiders. Now there's a kind of a few things that really stand out in terms of the role that those people have and the kind of trust that's given to those people in particular. Now if we look at the top one, Amazon manager. Um, so in essence, she recruited other people inside Amazon to be able to set up fake companies um, so that they could then have fake invoices. So she knew the process, she knew what people were looking for. Um, and then she kind of was able to commit a fraud of $9.5 million um, in essence against her own company. So she's a manager. She understood the process very, very well. Um, then we have a payroll administrator who was guilty of a 1.5 million fraud. They were able to divert um, payroll and to set up people who weren't even existing in terms of setting up new users, setting up new people in the organization. But we have an IT manager sentenced for hacking in sabotaging his former employer's computer network. Now, he was so annoyed with the company um, that he actually started deleting records, deleting servers, deleting logs, really kind of going out of his way in essence to cause as much damage as possible because he knew exactly what to do and how to do it. Uh, so this is really kind of the thinking about the how much trust um, do we give to these people in these positions and really kind of who is auditing the auditor. That's kind of the kind of things that we need to think about. So we think people are working in security. Um, you know, we kind of put them above the parapet because we trust them because of the role that they have. But that also means we understand policy, we understand the process, and we know how to bypass those processes. Now, Verizon in particular, um, as their recent report where they looked at data breaches, they identified a lot of this comes down to their abuse of privileges in particular. Um, and 80% of those um, were enabled, fraudulent activity, malicious activity, was because they had too much privilege in essence. And because they have more privilege than most people, so if you're an administrator, you're a manager, you know exactly what to do and how to do it. So you know those processes, you know how to bypass it. Now some of it just comes down to data mishandling. And this is where the most people kind of fall into this trap in essence. They have, the, there's no malicious intent per se, but it's just basically, I've just let data into the wrong hands, again, emailed the wrong person, I don't really understand policy. So really, what are the kind of summing the warning signs? So there's normally some kind of predisposition. And in essence, how we can look backwards and kind of think there's a pattern here. And so a lot of this really comes down to previous violations. So they understand the policy, they've broken policy, um, but don't particularly care. We might see increases in people swearing, profanities, and various different things. Now then there's a kind of internal and external stresses. So what specifically is going on in the workplace that is causing this level of stress to build up? And we've, we've had the panel before when we kind of talked about this burnout and kind of the feelings that are building up in people. But there are also external stresses as well. And people are worried about their job, they're worried about their finances, worried about their kids. There's a myriad of things that are going on in people's lives. But it's really that triggering event, that's something that really snaps in that person to make them kind of go to the next level, to make them want to go to the next level. And what we kind of see next is that concerning behavior. And what we kind of see is patterns. So they start to look for things they wouldn't normally access. They will start to download information. Um, they might do mass exfiltration or a slow exfiltration in particular. Now we're taught to look for mass downloads. Sometimes they do little and often, but again, because they know the process, they understand the policy. If I know what you're looking 
before, I'm going to do the exact opposite. So it's, <laughs> so it's things that we're kind of trained to look for. We also need to kind of look at them, some of those outliers as well. So when we kind of look at the planning and preparation, it's again, they understand policy and they understand if I'm going to start to uh, exfiltrating data, it might trigger an alert. You start to see different behavior. So what am I going to do as a result? Well, as we sort of said, I can delete the logs because I have admin access. I can also change passwords. Um, and I can kind of start doing all of these things in advance because I know what you're looking for. Now, I want to kind of talk about, and again, is how much trust is too much trust. And so we kind of in this, and we have this belief um, that someone is wearing a uniform to the military, the police, someone in a high vis jacket with a notebook or they're walking around, you're probably going to give them access because they look like they're in authority in essence. So I want to talk a little bit about the case of Jack Tashira. Um, so if you're familiar with Jack in particular, he's a disgraced airman uh, in the US, 21 years old, um, who was found to be leaking highly sensitive military information into Discord, sharing it with his mates, in essence. And this was like um, information relating to the war in Ukraine um, and various other military operations. Um, there's a kind of a backstory to some of this in particular when we think about what was the pre disposition. Now, there's a couple of things. He's not actually come to trial yet. He's being held in prison by the FBI because he's a high flight risk, um, not just because he could leave the country, but actually from an espionage perspective, there's a real concern that he could be taken um, or by someone in Russia, China, because of what he knows. Um, but also, he's very dangerous a person. So when we talk about predisposition, he was given multiple warnings um, for downloading information. So his bosses, whose superiors knew he was doing this, how was he able to do it? Um, so he's an IT administrator, but he also had the highest level of clearance. Now, there's a kind of a question there. Why is an IT administrator who's 21 years old, fresh into the military, got access to the most highly sensitive military information? But when we talk about predisposition, position as well. There was a pattern even before he joined the military. He had an obsession with guns. Um, and he tried twice to apply to the local police for a firearms license. And he was knocked back um, because he was actually suspended from school um, when he was about 17, 18. Um, but because of gun violence, because of things he said, the things he wanted to do, very racist. But when he joined the military, and now he's got a kind of military badge, he went back to the police and said, you should trust me because I'm in the military. And they did. And that's where they actually gave him a firearms license. So kind of which one came first? If we then kind of think about some of the stresses that he was under, so there's still a lot to come out about why he decided to do this. Um, but as I said, he was really obsessed with guns. He was really obsessed with the military, went out of his way, in essence, to try and find some of this information. So the motivating trigger and where he kind of escalated is kind of going onto this Discord site, basically showing off to his friends and going getting more and more intelligence and going really to the nth degree. So what was some of the concerning behavior in essence? So I talked about a little bit of the fact when he was arrested by the FBI at home, they found multiple military paraphernalia in his bedroom. So he had pump action shot rifles, he had grenades, uh, he had an entire plan, a manifesto, um, and really kind of went to the degree um, of how he was kind of going to shoot up people, how he was going to convert a van, and kind of do all of these things. So it's not just the fact that he was doing this at the military, he had a kind of a whole persona, if you like, and a huge amount of planning and preparation went into what he was doing. So initially, he was copying information down. And then he was like, oh, this is taking too long for me to just to copy it, write it, literally write it all down. So I'm just going to print it off, take it home and take pictures of it and put the pictures up. Now, there's a whole bunch of things that we then have to think about, about some of the challenges, about how we vet people. So how do we get that understanding of people in advance? Who are they? What are they doing? 
some of the kind of interests that they have because of what they reveal to you and what they reveal to their friends and what they reveal to these subgroups on Discord is completely different. But how do we keep verifying? So once we've given them that access and we've given them that trust, we have to keep verifying with what they're doing. It's really dangerous to monitor different aspects of people's lives. So when you think about social media, the different groups that people are under, and this, we get into this realm of this is big brother. We're monitoring everything. And where do we get the balance between privacy and security in particular? And we know privacy is a human right. There's a lot of people that said you cannot delve into people's private life. You can't go look, rooting around Discord or various other sites to see what people are really doing or really how they're going onto the dark web and all of these kind of different things combined. And the real danger is when we just ignore the threat completely uh, and kind of pretend it's not going on. And I have seen this. I have seen one public sector entity um, who said they would rather not know um, because if they do know, they are obligated to do something about it. And I'm just like, oh, What? Um, <laughs> and so you kind of have this, you really have this balance with regards to how many people will put their kind of uh, head into the sand and actually want to actually do something about it. Now, I kind of just give you a little example, um, a real world example. I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit here. But in essence, this is a real world story of corporate espionage. Jane, uh, in essence, was, uh, she stole information, proprietary information from her company. Um, and she, in essence, was, there was no visibility into that data. She was just able to exfiltrate it. The DLP didn't flag. And she was able to kind of carry on all of this abuse. And she was actually put into prison as a result. But there was multiple opportunities that could have happened if we had proper insider of threat, proper monitoring. And some of that is about information protection. How do we classify the data, no matter where that data lives, no matter who's got access to it? Utilizing machine learning, behavior analytics, for us to be able to identify that suspicious behavior, those anomalies, what are they doing, how are they doing it, and then having that triggering alert. But the adaptive protection is taking action as it happens. Most insider threat, the only time we know about it is after the fact, once the data's already leaked. Uh, but it's really about having the intelligence and having those kind of insights. Kind of just to sort of round out a little bit, is empathy negates apathy. So in essence, it's what we were talking about before with regards to this. There's so much technology will do, but it's really having that well-being. It's understanding our people, understanding those stressors, understanding the grievances people have, the, where those people are really going to trip into being a whistleblower. What can we do about it and how we can actually engage our people, make them feel like they have that psychological safety and there's a safe place behind it. So technology will only go so far in terms of managing this threat. We actually have to have well-being into that as well. So shameless plug just to end with. Uh, <laughs> I have a new book uh, coming out in March, which is Understanding the Cyber Attacker Mindset. Now, this is looking at the humans behind the attacks, their motivators and their triggers. Uh, I have an entire chapter dedicated to the insider threat and Jack Tashira. I go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, so I know I'm over. I know. Thank you for the reminder. And um, I'm getting told off by John. He's like, you, you get off the stage. Um, so apologies to the next speaker for over <laughs> overrunning. Um, but I will be around later as well. We don't have time for questions now. But I, I'm going to get off the stage. Thank you. <laughs>